didn't throw it this time. <laughs> and I read ahead this time. So Vernon uh, is going to give our message. Pastor Vernon. Shalom. <clears throat> I, uh, that second to last verse uh, just reminded me of something that I said, the lifter of your head. There is a verse in the Bible that talks about us being slaves and we, he redeemed us and we can, we lift our heads or something, some kind of phrase, just uh, something to look up. I started to look it up, I didn't have time. I had to go shake, shake people's hands. Uh, anyway, that's a side note. This morning, I wanna look into uh, <clears throat> what Jesus, when he, was, when he was getting ready to uh, be betrayed and arrested, he went over, he spent time going over with the disciples of how that, uh, how that he would, you know, would be leaving and, and how that, uh, uh, you know, how that he was uh, going to be betrayed and taken from them. Uh, you know, and, and he did this several times, and they, they couldn't comprehend what he was saying. <clears throat> uh, and in fact, in John 13, 33, it says, Little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me, and as, as I said to the Jews, where I am going, you cannot come. So now I say to you, well, you know, how could this be that, you know, that's not why he came, that he's, that he's just gonna leave. Uh, you know, he's, he's something that these disciples had, had given up everything and they'd followed him. And, uh, you know, and they were gonna follow him, you know, wherever. And, and, you know, Peter said that, you know, he'll follow him to his death. Of course, we know that uh, how that turned out. But, uh, you know, it goes through the, you know, when Jesus chose his disciples, he, he uh, <clears throat> they chose him because, you know, it said, uh, behold the Lamb of God. They understood that he was the Messiah. Uh, and he went out and found Philip and, and Nathaniel and, and all this. Let's drop down to chapter 14 and verse uh, 19 of John. He says, again here, a little while longer and the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live and will live also. At that day you will know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them is he who loves me. And he who loves me will love my Father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Of course, they were thinking in a, in a physical sense. As Jesus says, as the Father loved me, I also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Uh, you know, in a nutshell, Jesus just gave them the whole, uh, you know, the nut, uh, relationship and, and how, to, how to abide in him. Uh, verse 11 says, these things I have spoken to you that my, my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. He's preparing them for the time when he's to leave, but he, he wants to, wants that joy that they have in him. You know, that, that hope that they, they look at him and uh, that uh, he wants it to remain full. In other words, don't be get, get discouraged. 
they did get discouraged to a degree. Some of them went fishing, different things. They didn't quite understand, but, uh, uh, you know, God's desire has always been that, you know, and it still is today that uh, we, we can uh, experience joy. And, and, you know, the Sabbath has always been sort of a day of celebration. It's a day when God's people gather together and, uh, and uh, you know, go over the, the promises and, 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 uh, and uh, you know, share God's word uh, and what it means to us. Uh, and, you know, I think joy is something that uh, all the world is, world is looking for some kind of joy or some, something to, to make them happy. Unfortunately, there's a lot of, a lot of other ways to, a lot of other places to look for that, but uh, there's only, it can only, true joy can only be found in the Lord. The disciples' uh, idea of experiencing joy had to do with, you know, being around Jesus. They wanted to hang around him. They enjoyed what he had to say. Uh, and, you know, th that was a good thing. They wanted to experience that. And I think, it, I think it's a natural thing for God's people to want to hang around other people that, are, that uh, embrace the same thing. I think that when we come together, we sit down and study, and we meditate on the Word of God, that, that that's, that's a wonderful thing. It should be a, you know, it's not a, to me, for a Christian, it's not a natural thing to stay home. It's not a natural thing to, uh, to uh, not be around God's people. Uh, I, you know, where we have, uh, We've moved numerous times in, in, in our, you know, our, our lives, and, and uh, we've always wanted to be around God's people. We didn't, we never, I, I never wanted to be isolated someplace where there's, there's no church or no fellowship. I think it's, it's really important because of, of the joy that we can share. Uh, <clears throat> but so often, you know, people, and, and, and it's, 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 it's easy to get into this mode, that, they want to get into the touching and feeling thing, part of it. They, they don't have the joy, it seems like, without, you know, experiencing the loaves and fishes or, uh, uh, you know, if there's any kind of hardship uh, that comes, hint of hardship, they, uh, you know, they get discouraged. Uh, <clears throat> so, you know, Religion, a lot of times, is uh, appeases to the secular, to the carnal nature. Uh, a lot of times, uh, uh, religion appeals to, uh, they entertain people to keep them there, or they, uh, they have some kind of other uh, appeal to, to keep people. But, but uh, religion, you know, it, I guess maybe that word needs to be defined, but but it, the way we think of religion usually is it's not something that God wants. Uh, God wants us to have a, a life that's full of faith and devotion to him. Uh, he, he wants a people that, to trust in him. And you know, trust and faith, is, they go together. Uh, because sometimes when we don't know, we just trust. When we don't know what God has planned for us, or what's around the bend, or what some circumstance that we we come into, you know, what's going to happen, we just have to trust. And we just have to have faith. But uh, you know, we we should be able to experience joy on a daily basis. Uh, I was thinking about about uh, Jeremiah and the things that he went through and uh, how he lamented over, over the circumstances. But uh, I think Jeremiah had deep down inside, he had joy. Uh, and the, the, the joy is epitomized in the scriptures and symbolically as a song. You've heard the song of Mo Moses that it talks about in 
in Revelation, different places, or a new song, that is spiritually speaking about those people that have an inward joy. They have, uh, they, you know, they have this song in their life, and it's not just uh, singing. It's it's just uh, it's just something that's there. It's joy. Uh, you know, and I think sometimes we have to ask ourselves, are, are we just riding on emotional highs or are we really have that real joy in our lives? Uh, you know, the, the, the kind of joy that we experienced when we first got to know the Lord. Uh, according to Paul in, in Galatians, he, it's, it's a fruit of the Spirit. It's something that comes, well, a fruit like a tree bears fruit, it's something that comes naturally. <clears throat> uh, something that we, we experience when we have a right relationship with God and with his son. Um, you know, God doesn't, uh, I don't think that, that he just allows certain people to have joy. I think no matter what we experience, we can still have joy no matter how hard those experiences are. So uh, I want to go into this a little bit. In, uh, I think we need to understand, one of the things we need to understand is uh, in order to have joy, we need to understand where we are in the scheme of things. Uh, in verse one that, that we read, he says, I'm the true vine and my husband, my father is the, the vine dresser or the husbandman. Uh, and then in verse five, he says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Uh, you know what? I'm skipping it. Let's go to, uh, I lost a page. <laughs> uh, we need to read. I'm referring to, uh, Oh, let's see. What was this? The next verse? Something through John through eleven. John 15, 11. Yeah, fifteen. John fifteen. <clears throat> Page two must be sitting on my desk. Uh, 1 through 11, it says, I am the true vine, and the Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, unless it abides in the vine, Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And, and they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so that you will be my, so you will be my disciples. As the Father loved me, also have, <clears throat> I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be full and remain in you, and that your joy may be full. <clears throat> uh, so, you know, this is this is uh, this whole symbolic uh, uh, example here that Jesus gave of of the vine and the vine dresser and, and uh, who that, you know, how that, how that all works. 
is really pretty amazing. It's a good analogy of, uh, of our relationship with God, our relationship with his son, how that we are dependent on him. Uh, you know, he says that we can't abide in him. Uh, if we don't abide in him, we, we're, out, you know, we're just destined to be burned. Uh, <clears throat> so, you know, it's, and it's always been God's desire for, uh, for uh, his, his people to dwell in him, to uh, abide in him, uh, no matter how you explain it. Abraham walked with God, uh, and uh, and God, God made great promises to, to Abraham, but uh, he had to walk with him, and we have to walk also. But uh, our salvation is dependent on Jesus Christ, because without him, there is no salvation. Just as we are dependent, if he's the vine and we're the branches, that vine will wither and die. If it doesn't, if it isn't on the vine, uh, <clears throat> anyway, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of times I think that uh, Thomas, when he when he saw Jesus after he was resurrected, uh, he had to see proof, literal proof. He had to touch his side and see the wounds, and that before he would believe. Uh, that's a, that's a, that's a religion that's based on touching and feeling, but uh, you know Jesus, of course, told them that uh, more blessed I are those who believe, and yet you know d don't see. Uh, <clears throat> when he says here, "I am the true vine, and my Father is." is the, the vine dresser or the husbandman. And then in verse five, he says, I am the vine and you are the branches. It, you know, it's right there. God the Father is the husbandman or the, the vine dresser. And, uh, you know, he's the one that, that, that owns it all. He's the one that, that is overall. Uh, he's the creator. And uh, Jesus is this true vine. Uh, and of course, we're the branches. Uh, there's there's uh, some great truths bound up in that. In that. Uh, Jesus is being the, the true vine and we, we grow from that, from that vine uh, as the branches. But, uh, you know, by saying that he is the true vine, that implies that there are other vines and uh, that there are, are vines around that are, that are not true vines. Uh, I know it, there's an analogy used in the Old Testament of, of Israel becoming like the wild grape. Well, the wild grape wasn't, didn't produce fruit, very little fruit. It, was, it wasn't useful. We, we have wild grapes in Missouri and I don't see anybody that goes out and, and picks them because they're little tiny th things that are hard. Uh, the birds eat them, I guess, but uh, that's about it. Uh, they're unprofitable, but that's not the true, you know, they wouldn't be considered the true vine. <clears throat> uh, you know, there's a lot of people that are in and out of churches and they're, they, they attempt to define life outside of Christ. Uh, in, in fact, they, they, they say that, you know, your salvation comes from a lot of different sources. It just depends on, on what avenue you want to take. And that's not true. Jesus emphasized that he is the, the vine and without him, there is no, no salvation. Uh, <clears throat> I think another thing to notice here, he isn't speaking to he isn't speaking in this analogy to those that are unsaved. He's talking to those that are in a saved condition. Uh, he's not just talking about salvation either. He's, he's addressing, addressing people who uh, uh, profess to be believers already. Uh, he's telling these followers that, uh, you know, how to about, go about finding life and, and uh, uh, that that there is a danger of, of, you know, of not producing fruit. 
and what, and what could happen as a result. Uh, some, I think, seek joy and fulfillment through ver worldly vices. Uh, folks try it, and, you know, and they try to find it in relationships and in, uh, in their work or, you know, of, of maybe one religion or of, of one type or another. But uh, Jesus points out that, you know, you can gain the whole world. And, uh, you know, if, if you haven't found it in him, it's, it's, it's of no no value. Uh, there's a, in verse five he says, apart from me, you can, we can do nothing. <clears throat> so, you know, what he's talking about is that there's nothing that we can do apart from him that has of any, any value, any eternal value. Uh, you know, uh, anything that will, there's nothing that we can do or work or do, you know, that, uh, that finds it acceptable to God, that pleases God. It has to be through him uh, in Jesus' name. Solomon talked about, he explored the different, different uh, things that mankind seeks out. Uh, you know, Solomon was a man of unlimited resources virtually. You know, he had wisdom, he, he, uh, he did great studies and searching of variety of ways to find fulfillment and joy in life. Uh, he, uh, you know, he considered all different things that he ended up, he, he referred to as being vanity, in other words, of no purpose. All these things that uh, we, can, we can look to or put our trust in, uh, but it, it just leaves a person empty uh, and it's, it's not fulfilling. Uh, you know, so many people have dreams of building their own wealth or empire and that, but uh, but it's it's it, you know when they die they they die by themselves. Uh, in verse fifteen, he emphasized that if you love me, keep my commandments. And he says, he says that just as he kept his father's commandments, and we knew what, what commandments he was talking about, he, he magnified them. He talked about, you know, how you conduct yourself with your neighbor. Uh, he, he actually, you know, the Sabbath was a big issue because, because the, the Pharisees had been doing it so wrong they had been they had been so they had so legalized it that they took the the, the true rest out of it uh, and that, that was one of the things that he 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 brought to their their attention how they kept the sabbath and how they honored their father and their mothers and that these are the commandments that he was talking about it wasn't some vague thing like you know just have the love of jesus i've heard people say that that Jesus said, well, his commandment is love. Well, that is a too all-encompassing to just, it needs further, further de detail to know what, what that really means because love isn't just a good feeling, something, you know, uh, I heard a lot about that during the, the hippie days, you know, uh, free love. Free love turned out wasn't, was very costly. Uh, it wasn't, it, and it wasn't free at all. <clears throat> uh, so we're branches, and that's it. As children of God, we're not, we're not vine dressers. Uh, nobody's salvation is, is dependent on us, and we're not, we're not the vine. Uh, we can't, we can't do anything to save somebody. Uh, you know, our, 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 our place in Christian living is, is really is just to stay connected and to produce fruit. And he tells us how to do that. Uh, that's it. Uh, you know, we are utterly dependent on, on God through Jesus Christ. Salvation is free. Uh, it's by faith alone. 
the, the, the place where most people get tripped up is what is faith, what is faith, and what is the evidence of faith. Uh, and they mis misconstrue the scriptures to say, well, there are no commandments, which uh, we're not going to go into right now, but Jesus certainly wanted us to keep those commandments. Uh, <clears throat> Our place is to be to be branches. We're to be servants, not the master. Uh, we're not the creator, uh, but God is, and God as the husbandman, He has rights to all of our lives. He has ownership. You know, Jesus talked about the, when praying about the, in John 17 about uh, praying for the disciples, how that those whom you, whom you gave me. We belong to God, and God uh, gave, gave us into the care of Jesus. Through Jesus, Jesus dying on the cross, uh, he cared for us. He, he was the one that was able to, to give us the keys to the kingdom. Um, but it's because that the Almighty God, the Father, was the one that, that uh, owned it all. And this whole idea of inheritance, Jesus as being the, the, the son, the only begotten son or the first son, he, he was the inheritor. And that inheritance is shared with us as co-heirs, it talks about in scriptures. But ownership is with the father, uh, you know, because you know, he has rights to our lives because he bought and paid for us. Uh, it was through his, his son's blood that, that we have salvation. Uh, you know, to God, we were just rebellious sinners. Uh, and yet, in spite of who we were, uh, God had mercy and he provided a, a way for us. So, you know, when we first made the decision to follow Christ, uh, it, I, I think everyone would agree that there was great joy in our lives because we've been we've been released from from prison, so to speak. Uh, but we have to, in order to experience that joy on a continual basis, which I think that we have have we have to be able to abide in Him. We can't get distracted by the world around us and, and, uh, and uh, you know, just, uh, I think really the, the way to do that is, is multiple ways. One is you have to stay in his word, you have to know what he says. The other thing I think it's very important is you have to stay in the fellowship. I, you know, I, I, I can't emphasize that, that enough. I think as a, as a, a young Christian, if I had not started going someplace where I felt that I could fellowship with people and really talk about what the word really says and that, and comparing that, maybe what other people were saying, but I didn't have to li listen to, a, a, I know a lot of people spend a lot of time listening to what other people are saying that you know already that you have a strong you've recognized the error of their way, yet people continue to listen to them because they're saying some nice things once in a while and it makes them feel good. But I don't, I don't depend on those things. I think the closer that we get to understanding God's word, the more we can get into God's word and the more we can get out of it. Uh, uh, this, this idea that we have to uh, read books and books and philosophies and, and these things, I think sometimes is, is a, an extreme distraction and it often leads people down the wrong paths and uh, teaches them principles and philosophies that are just not, not godly. Uh, and I, I really, you know, that has always been a challenge for Christians throughout the ages and that is why Paul talked about the falling away. And we saw that it already started, he said, in his time. We saw by the time Constantine came along, the masses just, just melded into, into this quasi-government, 
religion, church thing. And uh, most all your churches are patterned after that, that, uh, that style. <clears throat> but individually, we're responsible for our own salvation. Verse two and three says, every branch, in, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears, bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Uh, so you're not, you're not part of the vine until you're grafted in. Uh, you know, he's not talking to those who, who don't know him. He's talking about those that, that have been grafted in, that, that are part of the branches. And uh, he's saying that if they don't bear fruit, they're taken away. Well, that's a sobering thing. Uh, you know, he, he's not talking about separating lost people because you can't separate them. They're already separated from God. Uh, he's, he's talking about removing the branches that are not producing fruit. In other words, those that, that never get out of the milk of the word. Grace and, and uh, salvation is a good thing, but you got to go on. Uh, and and if, you're, if, you're, if you're not, if you're just staying a baby, you're not going to produce fruit. You're not going to be doing anything. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, you know, they're not just discarded, but, but they're burned up, destroyed. Uh, you know, all the, <clears throat> all the places that God takes us, we don't want to be taken to the pile of dead branches. Uh, as believers and as children of God, we, we should want to grow in, in understanding and, and obedience. Uh, and, and these things, when we do that, we, we naturally bear fruit. Uh, the husbandman or vine dresser is God, and he's the one that takes away the dead branches. Uh, and those, those uh, branches are taken, taken away because they don't pr produce fruit. An un unfruitful branch is, is someone who doesn't live it. They, they, they read, but they don't, they don't hear. Uh, unfruitful branches are, uh, they have multiple personalities. They're, depends on who they're hanging out with. They can come to church and have a good time, or they can be out in the world and have a good time too. Uh, I think most most fruitful branches don't aren't very comfortable being out in the world and and participating in a lot of things that the world does. Uh, unfruitful branches have other priorities in their life. There are other things that are first in their lives, and uh, unfruitful branches don't give. They're looking towards self. Uh, they complain all the time. Unfruitful branches are often uh, a stumbling block to others. Uh, they, they're into uh, worrying about other people, uh, as in gossip and, and uh, making assumptions and really judgments. Uh, they, unfruitful branches are people that can, they can talk holy, but they don't walk, they walk unholy. So uh, God knows, he, he knows our hearts and he knows when we've basically sold ourselves to the world or we've committed ourselves to him. And uh, you know, it's, it's not the job of others to, to do that removing or for us to do that removing. Uh, that's the work of the vine dresser. So in other words, it's not our judgment to uh, consider someone saved or unsaved. I think because we can't see the heart of men, we always have to have hope for mankind. And we have to have, always have to be ready to speak a word of, of encouragement in, in that. Uh, every one of us as, as God's children has you know, things in our lives that, that hinder us in one way or another. But uh, in Hebrews 12, 1, it says, he tells, uh, tells us to lay aside every weight that hinders us. And, uh, you know, when we recognize these things, we need to lay them aside, get them out of our lives. 
That's the pruning. That's when the Holy Spirit shows us something. And I think the Holy Spirit does show us things in our lives that are, you know, they were maybe blind spots before, but he, but uh, exposes us. And, you know, it's us, up to us when God is working on our lives to, to prune us. And we, we resist. That's, in reality, that's resisting the Holy Spirit. It's, 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 uh, it's the same as, as, the, as uh, you know, it's unrepentant sin. And as long as we, you know, as long as we continue to follow God, God is able to continue to prune in our lives. That's growing daily. Uh, you know, <clears throat> God works in our lives lately. The, I think the literal fulfillment is when Jesus talked about he goes away to prepare a place for us. Well, how is Jesus working in our lives? How is he preparing that place for us? He is building that temple and we are that place. It, we will be the, the new Jerusalem. And uh, you know, he's preparing a, a temple that's, that's fit for the kingdom. Uh, you know, the pruning process is, is not always easy, but it's something that's necessary. And, uh, you know, I think when God does the pruning, that we can experience joy in it. I think it's, it's a, it's a, it should be a joyous thing when, when some, someone shows us something or we read in the Word of God that, you know, this is what God wants in our lives, and we go towards it instead of uh, away from it. It, it should be joy if it, we truly, you know, I, I can't imagine someone not wanting to hear the truth. Why would someone want, not want to hear the truth that, that, that God has for us? But a lot of people take that stance that, you know, don't tell me this because I may have to change or, you know, I'm just, I, do, I don't hear you, I, I don't want to hear you. Uh, that's not a good attitude. That's a very dangerous attitude. <clears throat> In verse four, when he says, I, abide in me and I in you, uh, as the branch cannot bear fruit of, its, of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless it abides in me. He's saying that we have to abide in Christ. Uh, and, and that all sounds real spiritual and, and, and that, but you know, I think we need to realize what that really means. Uh, the word abide means to continue, to say, to, to, to dwell, uh, reside. Uh, this whole idea of tabernacles that it talks about in, bio, in, in the scriptures. We tabernacle with God. Uh, he, this whole thing about him being in us. We are the temple of the whole, this, all these, these word pictures in the scriptures it, it's, it's all talking about, about where our desires are, where our heart is, and where our dedication is, and, and what makes us obedient to him. It's living in him spiritually. Uh, so, you know, in order to, to stay connected with Christ, to stay hooked up with him and, and is to dwell in him is, is to continue in him. Uh, Jesus mentioned in verses 7 through 10 of the 15th chapter, said, uh, if you abide in me and my, my words abide in you and you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done, done for you. In other words, uh, we need to get into God's word on a continual regular basis and uh, continually you know be, be studying the scriptures but uh, also it talks about an act of prayer life in that when you when you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you well he's not talking about physical things he's talking about spiritual things and the things that we desire is you know, should be to, uh, to know him and to, to, to know his will in our lives. 
uh, <clears throat> as uh, <clears throat> in verse 9 he says, as the Father loved me, I also have loved you, abide in my love. Uh, he plainly talked that, that this was like the second commandment. Uh, the Father loved me and I loved you in the same way as God loved us, as, as Christ loved us to die for us, we love others. Just as he loved us while we were yet sinners, we can love other people while they're yet sinners and, find, and, and, and long for their salvation and, and share with them the word and have empathy towards them because that's where we came from. That's where we were. Uh, I think as human beings, we, we don't have the capacity to, uh, to love most people that are unlovable, but in, in Christ, we can have compassion on all, uh, not just for the general welfare. I think even more important than that, it, it's good to help people and to feed people and those kinds of things, but it's much more important to be, care about their salvation, to care where, you know, whether, whether they're going to be in the kingdom or not. That's a much big, bigger thing. I think it, it's natural for godly people to, be, to care for people's welfare and those things. But we know the nature of man, how that you can't just give people money. That's not going to make them a, a better person. It very often makes them a worse person because they expect it. But, but to care for their salvation means that, that uh, you know, you, you, uh, the most important thing in your life is to see them in, inherit salvation also. <clears throat> so what happens when a, when a, a child of, of refuses to abide in God? Uh, what happens when, when Christ, what happens when a, a believer is not bearing fruit in his or her life? His or her life? Uh, you know, really what happens then when actually it's a willing thing, the, the analogy only works so far, the symbolism, because it's not like this vine is able to do anything of its own, but we are. So in that respect, we can decide whether we want to abide or not. The literal vine doesn't, doesn't, isn't able to do that. It's just a, a, a symbolism there. But uh, God has no use for, for people that, that choose not to abide, that decide not to stay. Uh, and God is, fortunately for us, God's very patient. Uh, very, very patient. And, uh, but you know, if we continue to ignore his spirit, his, his pleading with us, uh, he does have a, have a, there's a point where, where he no longer comes to us. I think that uh, we we've, we've see that in, in scriptures and different examples that, uh, you know, whether it's whoever, different, the, the children that came out of, the, came, came out of Egypt, uh, there are those that, that were, were not, uh, they didn't keep going. They didn't trust in him. Uh, <clears throat> but in other words, uh, you stand condemned with no hope if you don't abide with him. Uh, you know, if you, I think if we realize this, uh, we have to, that we're not in him, we're not where we should be, we have to take steps to, to move in that direction. If we don't know him, we have to know him. We have to get to know him. We have to seek him out. He says, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may be remain in you and your joy may be full. God wants us to experience that joy. Uh, he wants it to go beyond our understanding and uh, you know, the choice is always there for us and uh, whether we're going to abide in him or not. God bless you.